Hey, welcome. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door. This is Ev Ash. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome a really smiley, a radiant Lauren Greif to my show. You can't see her. You'll see her on the YouTube version of this podcast, but it's fine. This is audio. Lauren, welcome. Thank you for doing this. Uh, give us about I a minute. I feel like you are next door. You're the entrepreneur next door, but I feel like with this, I feel like you've known you for a long time. It's just crazy. It's, it's, it's kind of weird, right? I mean, the first time I, I, I looked at your photo, it was like one of these, oh, okay, I'm in. That's it. Done. Uh, so, um, yes, in about a minute, tell us who you are. Oh, my goodness. A minute. Okay. A minute, yes. Let's be concise. My name is Lauren Greif. I'm the founder of Portfolio Rocket, and that is a consultancy for C-suiters and executives who want to get found in the hidden job in the hidden job market. So that's who I am in my work life. In my other life, I'm a second time wife. Um, my, my first husband, I divorced. Um, and my second husband is the love of my life. I have two kids, two boys who are out in the world and changing it. So I love that. And I think the most important thing that you need to know about me is I really, I love my life. I love what I do today. I love the alignment that it has brought me. And naturally, I want to spread that around like a good piece of chocolate cake. So everyone else has that too. It's a beautiful thing. And um, the, the part about the boys, we'll get to it. So I don't know if you had a chance to listen to my podcast, but uh, I usually start the same way and then there is no plan in place. It's really where we go, depending on the conversation. So I have some ideas of what I want to talk to you about. So let's go back to the early years. I run into you in, where did you grow up, by the way? So you're in Chicago now? I am in Chicago now. I initially, I, I grew up outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in a suburb and um, I'm not a suburban girl. You know, and, so and, I, and, city and, life was for me. And you have zero boston accent that's a good thing <laughs> okay was that medication or they just eventually it, no, it... no the the new york the new york new york uh drone that all out of me <laughs> new york will do it to anybody so uh i even lost my israeli accent well some people say i still have it i don't know yes, so sure. um all right so i run into you in Havat square where Havad i parked square, the car yeah. when you're 14 15 and I say, Lauren, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the answer is? Oh, what I want to be when I grow up at 14 years old was um, a photographer, graphic designer, without a doubt. You know, those were those were on the table. I, I very early on identified that I have kind of an idiot savant quality to myself that, you know, like we all get what we get, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I got that was different than I thought everybody had this was a, a really strong visual eye. I could see things, I could visualize things, I could take that visual visualization and I could manifest it in a lot of different ways. So I like to always remind myself that I still treat life like a palette. You know, every, every single thing that I do is pretty much art directed, by, but not, not consciously half the time. Was that because your, your parents were creatives or no. nothing, nothing? I wouldn't say that they were creatives. They were, you know, relatively creative people, but I think that a lot of this came from probably the earlier generation before them, which my great grandfather was an architect in Montreal he built houses. He had a really keen eye. My grandmother, who was the original badass, um, was also uh, quite the fashionista in her day. And she used to be able to mix and match different things. And she was kooky and crazy. And I just loved her to death. So I'm, I'm grateful that I still believe that I carry her spirit. And so a lot of that creativity, I think, came from the generation before my parents. Well, you know, sometimes the DNA shuffle works in good ways. 
Uh, my grandfather supposedly was a cantor in some Polish town somewhere, uh, died in a Holocaust with everybody else, but uh, I wouldn't even attempt to sing anything because that thing skipped the generation for sure. Um, so you wind up you you you've got that that keen eye and you but you wind up in skidmore college in new york and you are a literature english major yeah not a photography major no so i got to skidmore because it's a, a heavy heavy arts school in saratoga springs uh, and known for a lot of the programming that they have around textile designs, around jewelry. They have jewelry studios. They had all kinds of things that I got engaged with. But I love books. I love reading. And so that made my major a pretty easy decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I knew I was never going to be an engineer. And I knew that, you know, I probably wasn't ever going to be a writer per se, but I wanted to study literature and I figured, you know what, that's a, a pretty um, benign and, and inclusive skill set that everyone needs to be able to read and write. And uh, at the time, I also knew that with this craving to get into things that were related to the arts, that I had to combine that with business. And that's how I ended up in advertising. Right. That, that was going to be my next question. So for anybody that knows, if you want to go work in marketing or especially in advertising, English as writing, re, you know, communication in general, but, but mastery of English language is the easiest road to go from, to go into it. So you wind up with a very respectable J. Walter Thompson agency, and then you worked for them for five years. What, looking back at it, what was the, what was the biggest takeaway from that job for you? Mm. The biggest takeaway from my job at J. Walter Thompson is that, for those of you who are listening, at the time, and this is back in the 80s, so, you know, pepper this with what that this means today is I, I just wanted to learn from the masters. I really wanted to ensure that I had experience from the best of the best because I had had other agency experience that was more boutique. And then I had another agency experience that was more midsize. But one of the reasons why I wanted to work with and for J. Walter Thompson was to sharpen my tools. I wasn't so much interested in having the clout card and the, the pedigree as I was interested in making sure that I was learning from people that had experience that I refer to as 10 inches deep, not one inch, 10 times. I hmm. wanted to learn from people who were really committed, crazy, and, and brilliant in their own rights. I didn't just want to learn from people that had a title. I wanted to learn from people that wanted to create a legacy. So, so this is the point of the podcast where all my plans get tossed out and I jump in off the cliff because you said something interesting. Um, if we fast forward to what you do today, which is focus on, on I don't want to call you a career counselor because I think that's going to totally destroy the value and how you differentiate yourself. But you help people get noticed and and advance their careers. Let's let's simplify it. How does an English major get a job, get a job in one of the premier agencies, market advertising agencies? Do you remember how you got that job? What did you have to do for it? Because Skidmore is Skidmore is is a is a good school. Right. But it's not an Ivy League and it's not a so no. what was no. the what what was the secret to that one? So uh, I I actually it's such an interesting thing because it the clarity of this experience is is crystal for me right now. It's very competitive to get into a, a top tier advertising agency, especially when you have very little experience. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening is that 
I just out-researched everyone else. I knew more about what was going on in the industry than the, half the people that I interviewed with. I knew the problems that that company was suffering from better than the people who had been there five years. I got busy and I got scrappy because I wanted it. I wanted it. And, and to be honest with you, I wasn't going to take no for an answer. But what, what did you learn that, that, I mean, it is, it's a skill, right? Uh, of, of being able to differentiate yourself, yourself from other candidates mm -hmm. and walking into an interview, not to say, what can I learn and how can I get promoted, but to say, let me tell you how I'm going to make a difference mm -hmm. in your agency because I know what you're facing, the challenges. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly rare. Well, hopefully not that rare because that's the movement that I'm on. Well, but today, sure. yes. yes. Well, back, I'm, I'm still back there. Oh, yeah, back there. Back then, back then, people were doing a lot of the things that I think are archaic now, right? Oh, do I have the skills that are required? Well, of course, I have the skills, at least 60, 70% of them. But guess what? So does everybody else. Otherwise, they wouldn't be applying. <laughs> that's yeah. cost of entry. So. I think what was happening for me is that I knew it was going to be tough. And I also, thankfully, was good and desperate and humble enough to realize that, you know, I wasn't going to get in because I went to Skidmore or because, you know, I knew, you know, I knew how to dress cute. That wasn't going to change anything. They didn't care about that. They have a line of people at the door. And so I started pouring myself over the trade magazines and learning about the currency of where, where business was going and where it was falling apart. I, I studied the marketplace. So I'm obviously not going to go to an agency that's losing all their business because they're not going to hire. So I actually, but long before I did what I did, I started watching where, where the business was moving and anticipating mm, they're going to probably going to need to hire soon. They just won this huge piece of business. Huh. Mm -hmm. Let me figure out who I know that knows who somebody there and so on and so on and so on. So do you remember when you decided, so five years with Jay Walter, at some point you decide time to leave and you go to Discover. Mm -hmm. Very different. You go directly to a potential, someone like a client for Jay Walter, but you now you're going to the corporate entity um what made you leave well we we relocated i left new york city at that time oh. so it was a major 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 life change for me uh, living in new york city was was totally it was like a you know hand in glove like it was a perfect fit and then i decided to move with my ex-husband and relocate outside of Chicago to one of the suburbs. And when we got divorced, I, I knew I was never going to be able to manage the requirements of what it would be to be a single mother and go downtown to the agency world and be able to service clients and be successful. So I wanted to pivot over to the client side. So I'd have the opportunity to have what most people still talk about, which is I want to have some balance in my life. Hmm. I, I have things that are going on and I'm not going to be a road warrior anymore. And I'm not going to be able to pull these, you know, 10 PM nights, four or five times a week. It's just not, it's, I just can't do that anymore. I took on a different level of responsibility. And yeah. so I went, I went on site. And it it makes sense because I'm I work for an agency, an Israeli agency, a long time ago. But I think there's the the exciting piece of an agency work is that you have multiple projects and you don't really get bored. Um, but at some point, at least that that happened to me is um, I felt that I could make a bigger impact if I dove into one thing mm -hmm. and immerse myself. Uh, and, and that's the corporate side is where you can actually commit to your company that, and then make an impact as opposed to, I mean, it's exciting to work with different clients at different industries, but at some point, um, I felt I was maybe not maximizing my potential. Um, and, and with agency work, 
the clients usually dictate a lot of the stuff, right? And so you you want to make them happy. You know, there's a give and take, but uh, you still have to give up and compromise a bunch of stuff to keep that revenue going. So I don't want to go through the long scroll of of the different position you've held in your in your career. And so uh, let let's fast forward to. Um, I'm I'm going to read the summary of your LinkedIn profile, which is okay. pretty cool, right? First of all, I have a question. Why did you mess around with your name, especially the last name? You know, I mess around I, with it for for disruption. Okay, just well, to get to, be like, how do you say your name? What do you do? Yeah, and, and they're like, why did why did you do that? And I said to fuck with you. <laughs> I just, I like to be playful. Playful is, is one of my tenants and I, I, I you know, why not? Look, I, I, I looked from the first time I looked at it and I said, okay, I get it. She's messing with me and she got, she got my attention. So I had to look at it a couple of times and say, what is she trying to do? I thought there was a hidden message behind it, but it wasn't. It was just because LinkedIn is one of these everybody's templated and you used to need and you should really have your summary with this uh, and and you're breaking the mold and sticking the rocket ship in the middle so it says yolo three exclamation point and a i don't know what that is a mine a star career strategy c-suite executives 10x your impact accessing the hidden job market 80 85 percent of unposted jobs ex excuse terminator Forever excuse BG's exterminator. Plan. Exterminator. Yes. yes. Excuse exterminator. So I think we share our love for one common person. Um, that would be the guy I came across maybe 30 years ago. His name is Seth Godin. And I read Purple Cow. That was my intro to Seth. And I said, holy crap. He's a guy who is, there you go, linchpin. Um, he's a guy who, I wish I had half a brain, but everything he says, I it, it's I believe in it. It's just like, I wish I could say it his way. But, and and Seth is not for everyone, right? You know, he's oh, got God, no. 5 million blood followers and everybody in the universe knows him. There's plenty of people that don't know him. I just happen to be, fortunate that one of my friends in the city is a friend of his and I get to meet Seth and and I get to shake hands with him and I admire him um, and if you could see behind me next to my amazing picture from Santorini there's a giant book one of the best things I think Seth has ever created it he took his collection of his blogs and he created an artistic expression of each blog it it that book weighs 25 pounds and it was only a limited edition. I think mm. it was, I think it was $400 if I remember correctly. But anyway, the point is, I want to read the quote that you have in your summary. Seth quote, people get hired because they can solve a problem that hasn't been solved before, because the problems that have been solved before are easy to look up. That's why the skills of connecting people, standing up for what you believe in, and making a difference are not significantly more important than the ability to solve a quadratic equation. That's a quote from Seth. And he's brilliant and he's right. Of course he's right. Um, and, it, and it's interesting because um, I spent six years as a graduate professor of marketing at two university graduate school in the city. I still mentor my MBA students who are all managers and executives. It's mostly about career choices. And and I want to tell you what I used to tell the kids. Well, they're not kids. They're all people that work full time in executive positions. But uh, every not every single one. But it's it's frightening how people, how unhappy people are in their choice of careers and what they do. And what I used to tell them when some the question came up, what should I do? And for me, everything in the world is marketing. And I said, look, there's, there's a concept. And I taught a class on what we call self-marketing, which is the stuff you do. Uh, and I said, listen, if you work for a company 
where you're unfulfilled. You, you work in a culture that does not support you, that doesn't allow you to grow personally and professionally. And you dread getting up in the morning. And at the, at the end of each night, I give my students exercise all the time. When you brush your teeth, look in the mirror and ask yourself two questions. Have I been productive today? And second question, have I made a difference in someone else's life? If the answer is yes to both, great, happy life. If not, it most likely comes from where you spend more time than with your family. So my advice, get the hell out. Run like hell. And I don't mean be stupid and quit your job and go to zero income. But I mean actively get out of that environment because before you know it, you'll spend 10 years in this black hole of nothingness, of average, and you're never going to leave because you're going to say, well, I already know the people here 10 years. Why should I go try something? Else? So with all that introduction, I want to ask you, you chose a career path of helping people, executive, C-suite. Um, why? Why go there? Because you're you're creative. You're a marketing person. You visual, you know, the, the world is a canvas. This is different. No, it's not. Well, not the marketing piece, but right. So but your search is a marketing campaign, right? Mm -hmm, yep. We're the product and service mm -hmm. in, in that campaign, right? The question is, why do I do this? I do this because I am uniquely qualified to remove the root canal from the process. And I've created a curriculum that makes the thing that people dread almost the most, which is why they end up staying in these horrible jobs, because they assume that the process is going to suck. So they shelter over here and cling on to what they know, because the, the perception that the job search is going to be long and hard and grueling and filled with rejection and all that stuff is going to be worse than what they have. And so if you don't, if you don't find out how to do this, what's really going to be worse is you're going to turn that entire process over to people like recruiters, which I used to be one, or job boards that have no ROI and don't care one bit about your fulfillment. So there's, there's the cost of not doing something like investing in your career where you're spending all this time that's the source of so much fulfillment. And God only knows, I, I, I've been a terror when I hate my job. My family wants to, wants to divorce me. I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. It's and interesting. So, you know, when, when you listen to Seth and read his stuff for as many years as I have, he always talks about the, the industrial revolution where everybody was brainwashed to go live in a square and, you know, get, go, go, you know, study, get a job and in, and in your job, do what you're told. And if you do what totally. you're told, you live totally. happily ever after. Right. And, and we know that, we we know that that universe doesn't exist anymore. There there are no companies where you can commit to the next 20, 30 years and retire from. It just doesn't exist unless you work for the Earn government. At the C suite is faster than it's ever been. CMOs 40 months. 40 months. That's it. So but so but why? So you you're this is your you're in it, right? I'm on the outside and at times with my with my clients. I help them recruit for certain positions, uh, sometimes executive, a lot of times for marketing, sales, customer service. Lauren, it is practically impossible to find anybody today. Uh, and, and again, if you go the traditional route, and I'm talking about some, I, I'm not talking about an employee who's looking to change jobs. I'm looking at an employer who's looking for the diamond in the rough, the people that you work with. Not mm -hmm. the cookie cutter, same thing, same thing. Um, job boards are not it. The monsters, the career, the indeed, it is a royal waste of time. And and the amazing part is people put themselves on there and they never interact. They never respond. Even if you reach out and say, 
your resume looks interesting. I want to interview you. Silence. It, it it's it's an insane it, it's an insane reality, especially coming off the pandemic, where everybody got a jolt of reality. Right? Maybe this is not what I want to do for the rest of my life because I hate my job. And and in any time, because most people don't think that way, I could be dead. Okay, so this was holy crap. I'm going to be in a on a ventilator in a hospital, texting my family, "I love you, goodbye." I don't think it lasted this long, but but you are your approach. To this is very very different, right? Do people find you and and say, "I am, I need to change my job." I want to change my job. I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. My life is, maybe it's not miserable because CMOs make decent salaries, right? But so what do you tell them when they come to you? So they come for many reasons. Some of them have been involuntarily exited. We know that, right? And yep. their back is against the wall. And what they've figured out is that what they used to do, even though it can be very soothing, Oh, I'll just hit apply now. And then I'll be able to tell my husband, you know what? I applied to 10 jobs today. It can be very, very placating, right? Ooh, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like I'm doing something even though there's no ROI. So they come to me because they're frustrated and they're sick and tired of not getting any traction. That's one reason. Other people come to me because they're building a runway while they're on the plane. I have a lot of clients that are resting and vesting right? They know that they're not going to stay past that period when they're going to get their payout, but they don't want to enter into the marketplace and, and be without the, the strategy. So they, they are forward thinking enough to understand, I've got to back out some time if I want to time this correctly. So they're, they're preemptive. Other people come to me because truthfully, they are just like, I haven't been in the job market in double digit years. I am not in Kansas anymore. What is going on here? I am so out of sync with what happens in this marketplace. And it will take me so long to figure it out. I would rather just hire you. You've already studied this. You give me all the tools that I need and be on my sidelines so that I can get to where I need to go faster. So, so there are so many reasons, but all of those are those would be the top three. So a long time ago, as in, you know, white beard years, <laughs> I was applying to job in a New York Times Sunday edition, right? You remember you lived in New York, you remember those? If you're looking for a job, you can wait for the Sunday Times because there were lots of different jobs out there. And then there were display ads. That and I remember them clearly, similar to some of like your pitch when they said most of the jobs are not advertised, right? Right, and, the, and so the recruiters were pitching themselves by saying, "Hey, we have retained clients; they're never going to put an ad in New York Times. But if you want it, if you want a job, you come to us. You know, put your resume in my database so I can whatever." Yeah. Um, are you saying it's pretty much the same today? So what I'm, what I'm saying is that there are, um, wow, I mean, there are so many reasons why people don't post jobs. I mean, the most obvious ones is it's very expensive, right? It's very expensive to not just post it, but then also to make sure that the people on the back end are paid to vet the tonnage of candidates that are coming through. Mm -hmm. So you have, to have a, you have to have the manpower to be able to sift and sort that. And once you open those floodgates, I mean, all systems are going because you're going to get a lot of waste. They also don't post them because they know one of the most important things, which is that a referred candidate, somebody that you know, that have, that have you have endorsed, oh, that's the holy grail because that person is a quarter of the cost to acquire. They stay four to five times as long. The hiring process moves like the speed of light. They're already they're already a bird of a feather. If John is a rock star and he refers Jimmy, well, chances are they probably are both rock stars because why would Jimmy be hanging around with this guy if he wasn't all that? 
So he's not going to refer some dud. He's going to refer another, a, a, another mover and shaker. And then lastly, is that those people are generally happier in their positions. And so it creates a culture alignment because they're amongst other people that are already proven in, you know, in, in that same likeness. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons for why people don't, but ultimately every recruiter and every hiring manager has this thing that I refer to as the little jewel box. And the little jewel box is filled with all their favorite, favorite referred candidates, right? And those people get VIP treatment, which is why being able to build your referral network, not just for today, but for the seeds of tomorrow is so valuable because after a certain period in your career, typically at the director, senior director level, it's all about who you know. Right, which is, again, one of these old timers thing, which is, it's not what you know, but who you know, right? It's it's your connections, your and referral. Who knows you? Oh, and who, oh, who knows you? Yeah. Um, so that that takes care of the C suite, the director level, C and C suite people. What happens to the middle managers? Is that is that dead or they're? they can no, it's them? not. It's not dead, but usually those people still have a. I mean, not to say that they shouldn't be you know, delving into these practices, but they're, the middle market is usually um, in high demand. And the reason for that is th they have the experience that the more junior or entry level people do, but they're not so expensive as the folks, you know, that are at the 350, 750 level, right? They're in, in between. So they have enough information and enough experience to be able to move the business and do the day to day and their demands are, are, are usually less, right. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of their compensation, in terms of, you know, some of the other areas of ownership. So, so, so they, I, I, they're ahead, still, they still have some life left on, mm -hmm. on either job boards or working with recruiters. So I, I have a, a naive question, which is, the the economy is driven primarily through startups, entrepreneurial ventures, and smaller companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we when we always say C suite, and we we start throwing salaries in the you know three hundred thousand, four five hundred thousand. Those are not the salaries that you know these kind of companies pay. Like that's my tribe. The small business has always been my favorite and my tribe. Um, and and the startups usually don't have money to begin with. They're just in the process of raising money. So some of them might take a giant leap and bring in the CMO to enhance their company, which allows them to attract more investors because there's a there's a serious heavy hitter that's part of the team. Um, but I work with a lot of founders uh, in a startup phases, and they're bootstrapping. What's the answer to them? I mean, they need the talent. They can't afford it. Right. What I mean, do they do? Usually, you, you know, this is usually an equity play, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they don't have, they don't have the, the resources to pay out. And anybody who is interested in those opportunities is usually in it for, I mean, when I say long term, it's hard to say that with a startup because you just never know what long term is. Mm -hmm. But that um, that being said, the incentive for them is usually a piece of ownership, not just in the ownership of the company, but ownership of their of their domain. Right? You're talking. I you can have a bigger impact in a smaller pond. Now you could lead this, drive this, build your team, do this, do that. Listen, there, there is, you know this, right, Zev? There is no perfect um, matrix. Every organization and every structure has its upsides and, and, and challenges. You know, mm -hmm. the larger companies, oh, you have, might have more resources, but you also have more red tape. 
you know, the startups, you have less money, less resources, but you have no red tape. You have, you have chaos. Or if you're the kind of person that likes to bring order into chaos, this is a, this is a place for you. So they each have their upsides and, 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 and constraints, hmm. but usually, usually it's ownership on, on both the actual business side. Oh, you get to be a partner. You get to own a piece of the business, cross your fingers for some kind of, you know, big win down the road and, or ownership in terms of your impact. So I, I think one of the, at least challenges that I always tackled in when I was, when I was hiring and I think it's relevant to today, um, you can have somebody walk in with what I would call a golden resume, right? They would have, they worked for the J. Walter Thompson's and then they went to, to, to a big corporate entity and then they went to a startup. They, they're just perfect on paper. They've got all the credentials. Um, but how do you go deep? How do you know that this person is real? And it's not, I mean, there are plenty of people that, that can point to their resume, but, uh, and, and I've come across some of them, they're pretty much useless. You know, they're just templated. They'll just do the things yeah. they learn in the big companies. So they're not mover and shakers. They're not going to set the world on fire. They're comfortable in their own lane. You can bring them in if you want to use them as a, as a prop, as a window dressing, but beyond the resume, how do you dig deep and you say okay i'm gonna go this is the person i'm i'm pushing for because he's real so to clarify am i playing the role of hiring manager in this scenario you so yeah. you're playing you're playing yeah you, so you picked up on it it's the smart you're playing two roles you get to be bipolar or whatever you want to be um okay. the person you work with yes right they, yeah. they learn your system and they and they do everything right and then and then you you switch roles and now you're the hiring managing manager mm -hmm. how do i know this person's for real so a couple of things and i think this is really important especially for your audience given the fact that we live in the digital age and we're not post pandemic even having nearly as much face to face interactions one of the easiest ways to tell and separate you know, the the fakers from, from the real deal is to get to, to know them on LinkedIn, right? What are they saying? What are they posting? Can I get a vibe from their content? Are they people who are sharing information about their industry? Are they commenting on other people's posts and giving great value away in their comments? Or are they just treating their LinkedIn like a poster and expecting everybody to come to them. Right? Yeah, the rare, I mean, that is a lot of evidence right there. So you can, you can put all kinds of, I would say, pretty safe assumptions together based on some of that activity, right? That's a, that's a great litmus test. The second, Wait, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. So, People hire people. They do not hire resumes or LinkedIn profiles. They do not hire credentials. Because like you said, they're just, they're just a placeholder that's supposed to sound like something. And there's a oftentimes, and you alluded to it, right? They look good on paper, but in reality, they're falling short. This is not the person that I expected from this. They showed up late. Oh, I don't care if you went to Harvard. You can't write an email for your, you know, to save your life. I mean, all those things are part of clearly your personal brand, what people are saying about you when, whether you're there or not, right? Get, that's Gary Vee, what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. That's your reputation, your brand. Hmm. So there's a lot of, you know, information that's hiding in plain sight that you as as a hiring manager believe you me they're looking because recent studies have have supported the fact that they're looking for people who are developing their own voice and thought leadership 
They don't want a bunch of me too, me too, me too's. You know, so if I, you're commenting on LinkedIn, you're just writing great posts. You're not doing yourself any favors. Yeah. And, and I, I hope that that's what they're doing because my experience with hiring managers, particularly at the, the people whose job is to filter through the resumes and go through their low level administrative staff, they give them a template and they say this X amount of years of this or this, if they're not throw them they're out. That's some keywords, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, I mean, we'll talk about AI in a second, but the recruiters have their own algorithms where they take out the keywords out of your summary and your history, and then they pick you out. Um, if it was me and I was looking to hire someone like you, just in the way you write your name, I would have said to you, you're hired. Cause, because, no, but, but seriously, I think the challenge with LinkedIn, and, and I, I, I agree with you, but I also think that people are, the person that will rise above to me will be somebody who is courageous enough to be different and say things that are not expected and be honest about how they feel and what and what they believe in, not be risk aversive or stay within the, the lane because people are watching. So to me, someone who is writing their name with initial caps, low caps, and sticking, oh my goodness, you can't put an emoji in your name. That's unprofessional. Who's going to hire you? Okay, well, most those that are disgusted by the emoji in your name are probably not somebody you want to work for anyway, right? right? They're not going to be exciting. So you're going to like this and tell about my style of hiring because because I always talk about it. People used to come in and said, I'm hiring for whatever position and I'm in a conference room and a candidate walks in and they're dressed very nicely. They got the little briefcase or whatever and they have a manila folder in their hands and we know what's in there. And they sit down and I'm sitting in the conference table with a cup of coffee and there's nothing on the table. Oh, would you like a copy of my resume? I happen to have an extra copy because that's what you tell them to do, right? And I said, no, no, I'm okay. You don't want my resume? No, I don't need your resume. Oh, so we're not going to talk about my resume? No, we're not. And they stunned. And they said, do you know why? I said, no, I read your resume. That's why you're here, okay? But what I want to spend time is I want to know who you are. I want to get to know you. And uh, my opening statement was always, please be truthful and honest with me i'm pretty good in assessing bs but don't don't pretend to be somebody you're not because if if you fake it out and you fool me and i've made mistakes so two weeks three weeks down the road you started you're going to be out of a job again so just nothing you say is going to be used against you i just want to know who you are okay it's a date let's get to know each other okay why because i need to know that you're a person that i can work with and there's a team that I know pretty well, would you fit in, okay? I don't care about your resume. Honestly, I have hired people outside of our industry more often than not because I wanted someone that I can teach about our corporate culture and how we do business about, and not someone that comes in with their own bag of, this is how we used to do it, all that stuff. Uh, and I think that's, there, there is a still today tremendous, lack of skills of people that really know how to interview and ask the right questions as instead of just following this same templated stuff so i i guess i was going to ask you because because you're an entrepreneur this is your business and the marketing question i always ask anybody i work with that has a business is and nine out of ten of them answer it wrong or don't know how to answer it what problem are you solving Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I'm pro I'm solving the age old problem of the root canal, the root canal of the job search, right? That's the problem, and the problem why it's so bad is because if people knew that there was a better way, they would be all in on it. They just don't know because it's been so habit forming, and their perceptions around it have been so ingrained and embedded everybody talks about it. Introduce me to one person that says, I can't wait to get to my job search. Mm -hmm. But, but can't but, wait for the next adventure. They're clinging to the security of what they think is 
the way to go about it or any of the the noise that says this has to be bad. That's the problem. And the problem is really about uh, the problem with alignment underneath that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that people, people think that the job description is going to drive their fulfillment when the only thing that they're aligned to is, is, is the recipe that's on, in the checkbox. It's nothing to do with exactly what you're talking about. I just want to talk to you. I don't care about your resume. I know how to read. I want to know, you know, what it is that wakes you up in the morning, what mm -hmm. grinds your gears, you know, what you do in, in, in the middle of a health storm. I want to know how you handle, you know, things that are really messy. Those are the things that are happening in the business, not the fact that you're a proven leader with 20 years of experience. That's just, that's just like a bunch of, you know, rhetoric. Yeah. And, and I think Seth ends a lot of his, especially on his podcast, uh, the Akimbo podcast, but he always ends it with the same thing, like go make a ruckus because that's what he believes in. And people that make a ruckus um, for people who are, I guess, not Yiddish, not Jewish, a ruckus, it's not, that's not even an English word, is it? I think it's more of a Yiddish word, whatever. But just basically go break things, okay? Right, go, go make go some noise, things. go stir things up. Yeah, because that's that's really how you differentiate yourself as, as a person. And that's how companies different themselves ultimately their success is because they didn't follow i mean my favorite saying you follow the herd you get slaughtered right same idea you, yes. you're gonna go you're gonna put your resume on monster indeed career builder good luck no one's ever gonna respond to it the average response rate is three four five hundred resumes no one's gonna look 1. at it 1.2 percent oh there you go so um and i, I, I say it i say it this way i hope your audience is listening maybe even a post-it worthy mention here different is better than better don't look to be better look mm -hmm. to find the way that you can celebrate your differences and find find that piece of yourself that is so ownable by the way you forgot on my linkedin profile that i'm a forever bg's fan i'm getting to that because oh, that's really important that's the most yes. important thing here Yes, I'm. I'm one of the rapid questions I'm going to ask you. Hopefully, we'll see what the answer would be. But so I want to. I want to jump into. I don't know, Lauren. There you go. But you have. Is that David Bowie behind you, though? Yeah, of course. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, so, I, I want to jump into a topic then, and and admittedly, uh, I get nauseous and and disgusted when the human human race finds a shiny object and everybody starts diving into it and everybody's talking about it because when you talk about it, it seems like you're smart because you know how to talk about it. And of course, the topic is chat GPT and AI. And I've watched a few of your YouTubes when you interviewed the guy from Wharton, really cool guy. Uh, yeah. But um, Look, I, I came up with a term. I think it's mine. Maybe I stole it when I was sleeping. Uh, the term is lazypreneurs, which is the generation of entrepreneurs who are lazy, right? They're, I mean, the, the the millennials, they just they just don't know how to work hard. And everything has to happen because you press a button on your keyboard or because you chatted, or because you get into a relationship via text and you break via text. And maybe one day they'll get married via text. Who the hell knows? So AI... That's nothing new. I've been using some of these platforms for the past four years, testing them. So chat GPT shows up and people jump into it and they use it and they say, holy crap, this is going to do my work for me. Um, so I actually tested it out before I spoke to you. I, I asked the chat to write a cover letter for me for a job. Okay. And it, and it did a pretty good job. So the question is, is AI, I know what the answer is, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. Is AI going to replace recruiters or is AI going to, going to just put a heap of BS on the fake it till you make it stuff because people are going to use it? How does that fit into the stuff that you're doing? 
So there are a lot of companies that have been doing one-way interviewing. Some of them have bots. Some of them have all kinds of automation in and outside of chat GPT, right? And the usage that you tested with the cover letter, we'll get to that in a second. But I can tell you, you got to be careful because in the same vein that hiring managers want to hire people, candidates and people who care about culture do not want to talk to a bot. Okay. So that's ridiculous. If you don't have that much time, if you can't interview your people, I don't want to work there. And a lot of my clients feel the same way. So, you know, it depends. It depends on what level, it depends on the kinds of companies, but clearly they're doing it for scale. Um, and it's a horrible, it's a horrible candidate experience. But at the same, but same time, I would also say that if you are, if you're incapable of writing three paragraphs. Well, wait, we're going to get to this. So this, okay. That's, okay. That was, that's one piece of the kind of automated AI piece is the, is the, the human interaction or quasi human interaction piece. Chat GPT isn't necessarily designed to replace the craft of writing things in its perfect form. It's there to reduce redundant tasks and to be a time saver. Now you should not take any of this out of the box, right? So one of the recommendations with chat, chat GPT is not to just take that output and cut and paste it, right? right. You still, you still should be doctoring it up. You should, you shouldn't be just taking something that's there, especially if you're somebody who cares about building a relationship, because they're going to read right through that. It's going to sound like, you know, somebody who's, you know, like Frankenstein, you know, walking like this, right? So you have to have a, a, some ability to touch it from a human standpoint. Remember who your audience is. That's one-on-one. -on -one. So, you know, I don't think it's it's the boogeyman or the boogie woman. I don't think it's it's an awful thing. I think in its appropriate usage, it has it has enormous amounts of time-saving capabilities. I mean, one of the things that people though forget is that the database that they're working on is not has not caught up to current day. So right. anything anything before 2020, okay, okay but not 20 to 2022. So yeah. that's where you need to fill in the blanks too. If you're doing company research on this organization, you shouldn't be using it off of chat GPT, you might want to get a baseline there, but then you're going to have to go in and do and supplement that with something way more recent. Yeah. I mean, I've been using it and testing a couple of platforms. Some of them are in the creative space, in the copywriting, and um, I would never use it as, a, like what you said, copy and paste, but I do find that it does bring angles and challenges your thinking that allows you to enhance what you had before and say, oh, wow, I didn't think about that. That's sure. interesting. And then you expand it, but um, okay. So I want to um, I want to run through a quick rap rapid fire, and then hey, I love these. It's okay, like, here we like, go. Um, so one song you admit you will admit to singing in the shower. Oh my god, every day, nights on Broadway. Okay, and that is that a Bee Gees thing? Obviously. Oh yeah. Yeah. That that okay that one okay. One person that influenced you the most, business or life? Oh my God. Um, the, the one person who continues to still influence me all the time is Frances McDormand, um, the actress. So she's a fierce woman and I love a good fierce woman. You know, it's amazing. Her, her, her images came instantly to me. I know she is. I, if you told me, go pick her out, I wouldn't, but she missed. Okay, next. Best advice you've ever received? Best re advice I ever received was from my dad. When you're younger, make sure that you're friends with older people. And when you're older, make sure that you're friends with younger people. Brilliant. Last one. <clears throat> if you had a billboard in Times Square, what would you put on it? If I had a billboard in Times Square, it would say love is the answer. Okay. 
It's a beautiful thing. Lauren, I know you got to run. Thank you for spending an hour with me, even though we booked it for less. Um, you can find Lauren. Look for somebody who completely butchered their name, last and first name, on LinkedIn. It's probably the only one with a <laughs> rocket ship in the middle. But I'll add how to find you. Go to LinkedIn, Lauren Greif, G-R-E-I-F-F. -F. The rest will fall into place. Thank you again. It was awesome. Hang you're the best. Here. You're the thank best. You. I thank you. Like I said, you you really do feel like you're next door. Thank you so much for your generosity, and thank you for for making this so much fun. I really enjoyed it, and uh, you're a gem. You're a true Thanks. gem. You too. Thanks a lot. Bye. All right.